Hello everyone, I'm Tom Sadler. I'm a software engineering team lead for BBC iPlayer and Sounds. Hope everyone's well, looking after themselves, and have uh, been enjoying the remote summit so far. So I lead one of the teams working on uh, the connected TV applications, so that's smart TVs, set-top boxes, games consoles, and streamer devices. Uh, this is BBC Sounds, which is our audio streaming platform. We recently went live uh, on selected UV, TiVo, and Sony devices, with more coming soon. But I wanted to start by talking about the history of our connected TV applications. First was iPlayer, our video streaming service. From iPlayer, we extracted the TV application layer, which abstracts differences across devices and provides a UI framework that's suitable for TV applications. Uh, we then built a sport app on top of TAL for the 2012 Olympics, uh, and then also a news app, and uh, Red Button Plus, which is our hybrid broadcast broadband offering. So in the years following the 2012 Olympics and the creation of TAL, we organised our teams around these four products. So some teams worked on iPlayer, others on Sport, News and Red Button Plus. After a few years of working in this way, running multiple apps, despite our best efforts, we were failing to collaborate and share code, except for the underlying TAL framework. This meant we were re-implementing features and capabilities across multiple applications, causing duplication and an inconsistent user experience. You might be thinking this is where inner source could solve the problem. That's not actually what we did at this point. Um, we addressed the problem with a change in technical architecture rather than a change in culture and process. So we reworked iPlayer, which was our flagship product and our most feature rich product into what we called the TV application platform or TAP. So this is a single application with varying configurations and data sources for each product. So all products were essentially iPlayer with different data and different themes. So this solved our duplication and inconsistent user experience issues um, and enabled all the products to benefit from any improvement made to any one of them. However, this monolithic web client quickly became very complex and with engineering teams aligned around the products and much of TAP being shared across products, teams did not feel confident in changing the shared code as they were worried about impacting the other products. So developers did not have a good experience developing on TAP. The fear, uncertainty and doubt meant that they would always make the smallest possible change to prevent impacting other products or other areas of the application. So therefore, making the smallest possible change resulted in little to no refactoring and missed opportunities to identify and reduce duplication. So aligning around products where much of the implementation was shared across products meant that the development teams were not empowered to evolve the code base. Here again, you might be thinking that Indersource could solve this, but Again, this isn't what we did at this point. Uh, what we did instead was rework our ownership model. So strong ownership can be controversial when it comes to inner source, as it can be seen as a deterrent to collaboration, but it can empower teams to unclog blockers to rapid development and innovation in their areas. And as we'll see later, defined ownership can help inner source by making the trusted committers visible and accountable. Ownership boundaries can be difficult to define within a monolith, but done well can greatly improve the code architecture, especially around separation of concerns. It's also important for related parts of the ecosystem, such as upstream services, to have clear ownership. So we redrew our ownership boundaries around capabilities and functionality rather than products. Some examples include launch, so this is things like identifying the TV device based on its user agent and bootstrapping tap. Navigation, in this example it's the sport homepage, but the navigation functionality is shared with the other products and different views within the applications. Uh, and playback, so playback was quite an interesting one. Originally um, the playback team owned both the media playback uh, and, and the user interface and the supporting backend services. But as we iterated on our ownership model we realised that a better separation of concerns was to decouple the media playback from the UI and spin up an additional team to focus solely on that area. So redrawing these ownership boundaries has enabled good separation of concerns, uh, which has especially been evident uh, in the evolution of the playback ownership. And this has empowered teams to innovate in their areas without worrying about affecting the other teams. For ownership to be enforced, it needs to be clear and discoverable. Within TAP, we've done this via the code owners file to indicate ownership at the file and folder level. Um, and it's also important that our backend services and any extracted libraries have clear ownership too. 
So we have an ownership tool which trawls GitHub to determine ownership based on which teams have right access to which repos. Despite the improvements we've made in TAP, it's still a bloated client with lots of technical debt. So when we built the Sounds on TV app, we wanted to build it outside of TAP. We did this by extracting modules from TAP for common functionality, such as playback, analytics, account sign-in, and TV device abstractions, such as mapping key presses from the varying TV remotes. And this was only possible because of our strong ownership around these areas of common functionality, which had improved the separation concerns well enough for these modules to be extracted and reused in sounds. But as I mentioned before, strong ownership can be can lead to a lack of collaboration, resulting in missed opportunities, duplication of effort and knowledge silos. We need to be able to collaborate effectively, and this is where Inner Source comes in. So all of the TV teams support contributions into their ownership areas from the other teams and contribute to other teams' ownership areas where their current work requires it. This doesn't quite solve everything. For example, how do we make decisions that affect multiple ownership areas? How do we progress things that don't fit neatly into any one team's ownership area? For cross-team decision-making, one thing that's really helped us is request for comments documents, or RFCs. These have empowered individuals or teams to submit, review, and contribute to proposals that affect multiple teams for either tactical or process changes. You can see that our first RFC was very meta. It was an RFC to start using RFCs. And these have allowed asynchronous contributions rather than having to call a meeting to make a decision, and it gives everyone a chance to contribute. Something really interesting we've seen with RFCs is they're not all coming from senior engineers and above. They're coming from engineers at all levels, which I think is really empowering and really uh, a really beneficial part of it. Um, and another benefit of RFCs is that they do form a record of decisions that have been made. Another way we collaborate across teams is by having regular tech forums with session notes written up for people to refer back to. These are for knowledge sharing or having open discussions um, and will involve things like disseminating knowledge on uh, cross-cutting projects, um, discussing larger RFCs or presenting takeaways and interesting points from a conference. Despite these activities and allowing cross-team contributions via inner source, certain things don't fit neatly into an ownership area and lack technical leadership. So to address this, we formed cross-team working groups. This essentially creates a group of people from different teams that collectively have ownership of these areas. They are empowered to make technical decisions for these shared concerns. Some examples of where we've done this are for shared UI components, dependency management and versioning, and defining common standards for modules shared across tap and sounds. Guilds are another great way to collaborate. This is our definition of a guild. Guilds vary from working groups in that they don't align with immediate work. And for this reason, we need to set aside um, allocated time for guilds. For us, we do this every other Friday. It's important that guilds have a clear goal and are visible and open to all. Some examples of the business problems we are solving are automation, where the guild helps align test terminology, tooling and practices across teams, and continuous delivery, where the guild works on improving our CI, CD infrastructure and processes. We've discovered some common things that successful guilds do. They have a backlog for working towards their goals, they meet regularly, they set aside dedicated time, and have a nominated leader that has the time to organize the guild. So we've looked at some of the supporting collaborative activities and our journey that resulted in adopting InnerSource, but how do we actually implement InnerSource in TAP? A point I want to make is some people believe that collaboration requires slowing down, but we think that our continuous delivery workflow proves that this isn't necessarily the case. So we use branch-based development and discourage long-lived branches. Whenever a branch is merged to master, a release to test gets automatically created, including automated release notes. Currently, the release to live is done manually, but we plan to make this automated in the near future. Having short-lived branches that are built automatically on merge means that we are working in an agile, continuous delivery environment. This is crucial with multiple teams working on the same code base, and it means that when teams are working within their ownership area, they're able to work autonomously. The automated release notes are essential to both the autonomy and the collaboration. 
teams can work autonomously within their ownership areas, but their work is automatically visible to other teams via the release notes without any additional overhead. Automated releases are enabled via structured versioning, labels on pull requests, and a pull request uh, template. This enables the release generator to determine the version number, populate the release notes from the pull request body, signal whether the re release includes audience facing changes, and link to the JIRA ticket. All this enables the transparency and visibility requirements of working in a source, but what about when a tap branch cuts across ownership areas? This is where the code owners file and our pull request process comes in. So using code owners means that the relevant trusted committers for a particular area are notified and the pull request cannot be merged until they've reviewed it. This is what I was saying before about actually ownership makes, um, makes the trusted committers visible and accountable. You can't merge unless the branch is up to date with master and has passed our automated tests. So this reduces the risks of bugs being caused by conflicts across branches. Uh, and you can't merge unless the version and user facing changes labels are present and the pull request template has been filled out correctly. And this enables the automated release notes, which are really key to working in this way. The pull request process is how you work on TAP regardless of whether you're making an inner source contribution or not, the main difference being who does the code review. And the automated release notes enforce consistent visibility of work on TAP across the teams. So by working the same way for both inside your ownership area and outside, collaboration becomes a lot more seamless. So in conclusion, these are the main points I want people to take away from this. When your architecture changes, your ownership model must change with it, and you can iterate on your ownership model. Even with clear ownership boundaries, you'll need to cross these, which is where InnerSource comes in. InnerSource doesn't live in a vacuum. Collaborating via other means is necessary too. And automating your InnerSource process streamlines collaboration and enables high-performing, empowered teams. Thank you for listening, everybody. I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference.